So last weekend is a nice day. Although it was late February, still very cold, probably 8 degrees outside. It was a nice sunny day. I had a day off. I thought, you know what? Let's take the old girl out and give her a good drive. Now, I don't drive the car hard. I don't really drive any car hard. I'm a very cautious driver. And people will say, well, it's a sports car, you know, they're designed to be driven hard. You know, take it out and give it a good thrashing. So I did. Took it down to the um, North Cliffs Road that connects Goodrevy and um, Portreath. I'll insert some uh, nice footage to give you an idea what it looks like. Um, and as you can see, it's a very, very beautiful drive. See on your left hand side, Atlantic Ocean, stunning cliffs, blue skies, all that good stuff. Everything you'd want from a B road to take a car like this out for a good drive. Now, to be fair to the car, it drove absolutely perfectly the whole way. I was in the pedal, up in the revs, giving it the onions, throwing it around a little bit, treating it as it should be treated. And as I say, the car drove perfectly the whole way around. However, I get home, park it outside, come in here, open the door, go to push the car in. You can't drive it in here because you can't open the door. Um, and there's a small pool on the floor under the car. Coolant, tell by the colour. I'm like, okay, fine. It's probably dripping out of a hose or something, you know, whatever. I'd get in and have a look. And um, all the hoses are fine. It's actually coming out of the overflow bowl and it's bubbling out of the overflow bowl. That's not good, is it? And that can only mean one thing, obviously the car was getting too hot. Whilst the temperature gauge said it was a 90, which is what it tends to stay at, um, it was obviously hot enough that the coolant coming out was expanding to such an extent, it was filling the overflow bottle, it was then flash boiling and then spewing out of the overflow bottle. So regardless of what the temperature gauge says, it was clearly getting too hot. Now people tell me that cars of this era, obviously it's a 45 year old car and engine, um, they generally do tend to run hotter than a modern car does just, just because basically. But I thought it'd be prudent to go through exactly why these cars overheat, the symptoms, the causes and what we're going to do about it. So that if you happen to have found your way here because you too have a Spitfire and you have overheating issues, um, it might be informative for you. I've done a lot of trawling through the old interwebs trying to look at reasons why, a bit of head scratching, um, and I feel I can consolidate a few into hopefully what is a short video. So, why do these cars overheat? Let's have a look. So one of the first and major problems looking at the front of the car is where is the grill? Obviously every fuel car needs a grill in order to keep the radiator fluids cool. And where's mine? Well, if you've got a Spitfire, you'll know it's in here behind the number plate. And that's your grill. So straight away there, we've got a huge problem, haven't we? The grill is small and it is 90% taken up by the number plate. Now, I always wondered why people who had things like E-type Jags always had the stick-on number plates on the bonnet, which I don't like the look of, but that's why. Straight away, your number plate is obscuring most of the grill. So the first thing to do would be to move the number plate. Now, whether that means you get a smaller one made up, have it down here on the splitter, or again, the obvious answer is to get a vinyl one made and just have it stuck up here on the bonnet. Police don't tend to get funny about number plates on the front, it's the ones on the back, because they're the ones where the AMPR camera is going to zap you. Front ones aren't as important, but obviously, to be on the right side of the law, you do need to have a number plate. Um, and it needs to be regulation, size, lettering, etc., at least in the UK. So first thing to do would be a relocation of the number plate. If we have a look at the inside of the engine bay, we can see that problem just as acutely. We can see the grill down there, and we can see the uh, back of the number plate there is obscuring a large portion of that grill. Now mine, as you can see, has an electric fan on it. I took the old mechanical fan off, which normally sits on the front of the water pump here, um, just purely to eliminate a little bit of the drag that's on the crank that you inevitably get when you have a mechanical fan. You don't need a mechanical fan running all the time on an engine. Most of them come with it because it's cheap. But you don't need the cab fan running all the time, especially when the engine's trying to warm up because it's counterproductive to what you're trying to do, even though the thermostat's closed. You know what I mean. So we can see the grill there, not a lot of space in there for air coming through. Now, the keen eyed amongst you will go, hang on a minute, you're missing the, uh, the channeling part. So you normally have a 
uh, cardboard covered uh, scoop triangular section on that side and on that side and I'm led to believe they also had a flat one on the floor which obviously is designed to channel air through your radiator so clearly when I bought the car those parts were missing again they're probably made of cardboard and that's why they're missing so it'll be prudent for you to have those things even if you don't have the stock ones you can easily make them up with a piece of aluminium a piece of plastic whatever it is and I'm guessing it just sits on these um, rivets here comes down here and angled towards the front obviously it still needs to be able to fit so the bonnet closes and this will help to channel any air that's coming through your grill directly in through your radiator The next most obvious thing is the radiator itself. Now, what I can only assume to be a cost cutting exercise, you can see that the radiator doesn't actually run the full width of the radiator support. This being the radiator support, you can see you have a four inch piece in here that is just a strut. There is no radiator here. And the same obviously on the other side. So why didn't they put a full width radiator in the Spitfire? As I say, I imagine it was purely down to costs. This is, as you know, an entry level sports car. So therefore they have to shave costs somewhere to make it affordable. But again, not a good idea for a car that tends to run hot. Looking at radiators online, I believe the later Spitfire, the 7981, actually had a smaller radiator again, which kind of, you know, baffles me a little bit. But apparently they did actually have an even smaller radiator. So. Next on the agenda would probably be a radiator replacement, getting one that is full width. A little bit like this one. So as you can see, the whole point of this video is I'm going to be putting a replacement radiator in the Spitfire. Now this one was from uh, eBay. They are about £130 in the UK. And as you can see, first of all, it's a much better quality radiator. It's a new one. It's aluminium. It's a twin core radiator, I believe. So we have lots of room for the fluid to actually run through the radiator. And most importantly, as you can see, it is the full width. It doesn't have that four inch plate on the side, which limits the size of the radiator. And it almost halves the size of the radiator. When you take into account that side and that side and put them together, you get an almost 50% again, bigger radiator surface. Um, it seems decent enough. It is made in China. This isn't like a local one made because you pay a lot more money for it. The TIG welding on it isn't amazing, but it is pretty good. And obviously they're all pressure tested, so regardless of how the welding looks, as long as it holds pressure, we're good. So if I just offer this up to the car so you can get an idea of the difference in the size. And there is said radiator, for the time being, propped in front of this one. But again, you can see the size difference. Obviously, all the mounting points are going to be the same. Hopefully, they're going to be the same. If not, I'll soon make them the same. We have a nicer cap, CNC machined cap, rather than the old twin-eared one. It has the same takeoff for the line. This one's a bit squished, so I'm going to get rid of that. It looks like it's got hot and cold too many times, and that obviously isn't going to help. So for the very new amongst you, and when I say new, I mean new to the world of cars, as well as Spitfires, let's just have a very, very quick breakdown of exactly what a radiator is, how it works, and what it does. So, as we know, we have both oil and water in our engine. You have the head, and you have the block. They have water channels in them, which is designed to circulate water around the engine, which soaks the heat out, moves it away, cools it, and brings it back. So, whilst the engine is warming up, this little chap, your thermostat, there's a small valve in here, a temperature controlled valve, this is closed. So the water stays within the block, the engine gets itself up to temperature, and then once it hits the correct temperature, or the temperature of wherever your thermostat is, this little chap opens. Water then travels from the top, because obviously water, hot water rises, cold water sinks. So hot water comes to the top, goes in through your tube into your radiator, where it then drains down through the veins in the radiator and is cooled. Mechanical fan on the back, or as I've got electric fan on there, also helps to pull air through the radiator when the car is stationary or on hot days. Otherwise, just the breeze of driving, driving air through the radiator, cools it down. The cooler water then sinks down to the bottom, into the bottom hose, and is then sucked back into the water pump again. So we can see this is the water pump here. 
This has the pulley on the front, so as long as the engine is turning and you have your fan belt attached, which also drives the alternator, then your water pump is spinning and it's pushing water through the engine into the radiator when the valve is open and cools it down. So nice and simple. However, there are other things which can affect the temperature of the engine, not just the radiator and the fluids so first of all, within it. Making sure you've actually got coolant. Oh, I got my face. I think I've been punched in the face. I haven't. First of all, make sure you've got coolant in your fluid as well as water. I see people filling up radiators with water and it's a really, really, really bad idea. So the coolant does a few things. Firstly, it raises the boiling point of the water. Secondly, it lowers the freezing point of the water, giving you more tolerance in both hot and cold climates. And also, probably most importantly, it has rust inhibitors in it. Because if you're running an old engine like this, it's a cast iron block, right? And iron and water and air, as you know, don't mix. You get iron oxide, i.e. rust. So if you're just running your engine with just pure water in it all the time, not only are you getting the maximum benefit from the cooling system, i.e. the hot and cold temperature um, differential, but you're also having rusty water running through your engine, which at some point in the future is gonna fail. Now it could be something like a core plug rusting through, having water pouring out. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll know how I had exactly the same issue on the front of the engine behind the engine plate, which required me taking, disassembling the entire front of the engine, taking the timing chain tensioners, the whole shebang off in order to get to that core plug, which had just rusted through. Again, because it had been sat left with water in it, and the rust had done its thing. So firstly, make sure you have coolant in your water. Don't run just water in your cooling system. Don't do it. Then you have your timing. Make sure your timing is set properly on your engine. If you haven't got a strobe light, go and get one. Okay, you can only do so much of it by eye, by looking at where your points are opening and closing. Get yourself a timing light. They're invaluable for older engines. Clip it on zap your timing, um, have a look at your timing marker and make sure it's set to the correct timing. If the timing is too far advanced, it's going to cause your engine to run hotter. At least I believe I'm right in saying that. The mechanic aficionados out there might disagree, but in my research, I believe that to be true. Second thing, of course, is the mixture on your engine. You've got the old carburetors on your engine. These chaps, which obviously um, induce fuel and air mixture into the engine. Now carburetors, as I'm sure you know, are either lean one way or rich the other way. If they're rich, you've got a higher mix of fuel to air, and if they're lean, you've got a lower mix of fuel to air. Now you would think that being too rich would make the engine run hot, right? Rich, too much fuel, bigger bang, hotter bang, that's going to be the problem. No, it's the other way around. Leaner engines run hotter than rich engines. And I believe, and again, I'm no expert, and I believe this is down to how long it takes for the explosion to actually occur in the cylinder. If you have a rich mixture, lots of fuel in it, when you get the spark and the explosion, it burns very quickly because there's a lot of fuel in it. If it's a lean mixture, it burns slowly, therefore has more heat for a longer period of time within that cylinder. So if you've got a lean running engine, not only is it really bad for your valves, because obviously they're constantly getting flamed as well, um, but obviously it can affect the temperature of the engine as well. So you can tune carbs by ear, or at least people who know what they're doing can. I'm, I've, I haven't got it yet, but I've recently bought myself one of those Gunson color tunes so I can actually see the color of the flame in the cylinder. Again, one of those things just to remove all doubt. Whilst I think it's set up properly and the car runs okay, I'm not 100% convinced they are set up properly. So a colour tune where you can actually see down into the cylinder during the combustion cycle, see the colour of the flame, I think is going to be invaluable. So in a nutshell, we have the air path itself coming through the front of the car, past the number plate, through the grille, into the radiator itself. Secondly, we have the size of the radiator. Obviously, the bigger the radiator is there, the more efficient it's going to be at cooling. Third, we have the actual mixture that's in the water system in your car. Make sure you have coolant in there as well as water. It's going to run better. It's going to help your engine live longer. Fourth, we have timing. Make sure your timing is set properly. And fifth is obviously your mixture on your carbs to make sure that your mixture is good. If you've got all those five things dialed in, then there's no reason why your car should run hot. The other benefit to having a nice wide core in my radiator is that my electric fan I've got currently isn't going to sit in the middle anymore, it's going to sit off to the side. I can now fit two electric fans in. 
possibly overkill, but you know what? I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. If you've watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm in the middle of making a different front for the Spitfire because I'm just stupid. Um, this is why I'm not moving the number plate on mine. So if you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, you're saying your car overheated, but yeah, there's your number plate, and you've just said that's part of the problem. You haven't moved it yet. It's because I'm going to have a completely different front end on my car reasonably soon, um, and that's going to have a watch much wider grille in the front. So for me, not really an issue at the moment because I've got something new coming. However, I might still, in the time being, though, invest in a vinyl sticker. I want to see how much they are because they're probably not that much, are they? However, for the time being, this is doing no good sat on my work desk, so let's get this in there. Work smarter, not harder. Mmm, cherry. As if by magic. The old nasty radiator is gone. There she is. I had to snip off some of my wiring for my thermostat and my horns, but well, that's not a problem. But yeah, she's been around the block a few times. And I say probably the original radio that came with it. And she ain't all that inside to look at. Oh, you can see the gunk in there. Obviously I had head gasket issues summer last year, so whilst I flushed the radiator through and used proper radiator cleaner stuff to clean it out, it's, um, you know, I don't know how good it is, I don't know how good it ever was, so, she gone. Ah, shiny goodness. So we got ourselves a second 9 inch fan, 20 quid whatever online obviously if you can fit two fans on your radio you'd be stupid not to wouldn't you really so they fit on there quite nicely the only difference between the two whilst I was sure to buy the same brand which is Aeroline this one's got these handy little um, eyes on it as well as the pegs for the um, well for these whereas this one the old one doesn't so it actually fits better without these things on it but if I take those off I've got no other securing holes on this one so I'm going to have to use these ugly ears on this one and then I'll just use the standard holes in the corners on this one that will allow me to fit them both on there quite nicely if I put those same ears on that one they won't fit I have to sort of twist them around a little bit and I don't really want to do that so um, that's how we'll do it now you get that same horrible mounting kit with these radios that you normally do these uh, one-way cable tie things where you push them through the discs um, I really don't like these because these um, these cable ties they're quite thick and there does they're probably about three and a half mil four mil thick and I don't really want to be stuffing those through the vents of my brand new radiator because the holes are much smaller so what we use is zip ties because that's what I did on the last one and if I just show you an old one the zip ties slide in through those vents quite nicely they still need a little bit of a push through but that has now gone all the way through so zip ties are going to interfere a lot less with your cooling fins as you can see that one is ever so slightly widened out but I think that's acceptable the only thing this one doesn't have is a drain on it I just noticed my old one has although to be honest I've never actually used the drain on my old one I always just pull the bottom hose off and try and drain it into a bucket as you've seen um, so that's make sure I haven't got one on the front no if I cared enough I could drill that and you know tap or do something and put I don't care enough honestly I don't as I say if you want to drain a radio pull the bottom hose off yoink it off and out it comes so it's no biggie so we'll get some zip ties we'll very carefully mount these 
through the fins. Then we'll just simply join our wires together so they run in parallel. And then we can start to get this back in there. As I say, I've got to tidy up my wiring a little bit from the old radiator. And there was a couple cables I had to snip in here, but nothing too drastic. And that new radiator should, fingers crossed, fit in there quite nicely. I know the horns, I know, they're terrible, they're horrible. But the ones that came with the car didn't work. They just sort of croaked a little bit. <laughs> so I got some cheap ones on eBay because they're just horns. Again, I don't care enough. They were like 15 quid or something. So, nothing else needs doing. Oh, the other thing I need to do is replace that piece of fuel line. I keep meaning to do it and I keep forgetting to actually go and get a solid piece of fuel line to put in there across um, in front of those filters and I keep forgetting and I will do that job while I'm here. However, it's starting to get dark. I've been at work all day. It's pretty grim outside. So I think it's time for an adult beverage. Belgian beer. Right, back at it today. Fresh day. The rain stopped, so we better get on with it before it starts raining again. This is England, after all. It will rain, well, all the time. Uh, I had to put the car outside because I need to get to both sides. So we've put the rad in. Everything seems okay. The bonnet closes. That's good. The pipe work all seems to be good. So I just need to um, start on the rewiring the electrics back in because unfortunately I had my relay for the horns and the little horn magic box all riveted to this which was nice. Obviously my expansion bottle was attached to it. These plates on the side whilst they're not good for the radiator are good for sticking stuff on so I need to find new homes for all this. Excuse the noise as always. Noisy cars. So there's our new rad in, which is nice. Obviously both fans now mounted on the back. As I say, we just mounted them on there with um, cable ties. Absolutely fine. They're on there tight. They're not going anywhere. And it's just a nice simple way of mounting them. It clears the water pump. So we've got a good, well you can see. Nice bit of space in there in front of the water pump pulley because that was quite tight last time. So now I've shifted the fan over that way. It's not fouling on the pump anymore, so that's good. Overflow bottle is back on. Got rid of the little kink in the tube that was on there. Fits in the brackets okay. All bobbied back on again. So, nice shiny radio to go with me shiny filters. It's all about the chrome, isn't it? So now I just need to do some jiggery pokery down here with all my electrics because like I say I've now got my leads for my radiator to sort out, I've got the thermostat for the radiator which obviously has this mercury filled whatever it is which goes and sits up there inside your top hose. This top hose is a little bit short but hopefully we won't get any leaks, obviously we'll find out and various other things to wire in. So I need to find homes for those now, which is going to be a bit annoying. So I might have to bring some of my wiring back up to the bulkhead up here and make use of some of the space in around the battery. Oh, and for those of you I know, the battery is the wrong way around. Some people have said, your battery's the wrong way around, mate. I know. It's fine as it is, but I know. We'll come to that. Right. Electrics. Right, that's all the wiring done. And yes, I know, it looks like shit. I'll get in here one day and get some cable sleeving around all this and tidy it up nicely one day. But that's all we need there. So we have the little control box for the horns, that's situated in there. We have the thermostat with the probe going into the top hose. And then lastly we have our relay for our horns. And the reason it looks a little bit all over the place is because we keep cutting into the wiring. The, obviously we have a switch live for the horns, we have a switch live for the fans, so we keep, rather than keep running switch lives to and from the fuse box, I keep tapping into them down here. And the same with negatives. I keep tapping into my negatives, splitting off and putting a junction in. Because it just makes more sense than running wires to and from the cabin. 
Um, but yeah, it's a little bit all over the place, and like I say, one day I will tidy all that up. However, that has been tested. Both of those fans work. I've tested them on my dummy switch in the cabin. If you haven't watched any of my previous videos, I put myself a little switch in just here. And that's purely just so that, you know, if I'm ever out and I'm driving around and the car is getting warm, then I can flick that switch on and then I know the fans are running because obviously that temperature, um, temperature sensor is an analog one. I think it's got like a mercury filled reservoir on it and obviously when it reaches a certain temperature it pushes back into the little dial machine tells it to turn the fans on now of course with all the jiggling around when you're driving that could theoretically break damage or just not work one day so when I wired that in I thought be sensible here James put a dummy switch into the cabin just run a live up and down um, so that I'm in every time just so I know that if I flick that switch on, the fans are definitely running and I'm not reliant on any kind of thermostat. That's why. Um, seemed like a good idea, right? So, everything works. I've tested it, the horns work, the dummy switch works for the fans, which means in theory that obviously the temperature controlled thing for the fans will work as well. So, I think the last thing to do is stick some coolant back in there, fire it up, check for leaks, and that should be that. She's up to temperature, seems to be okay. Dummy switches are working. And when I came back, the fans were running. So clearly they work from the thermostat and they also work from the dummy switch and there are no fires. So the wiring must be good. So we'll let it cool down a little bit, pop the cap off, top it back up and that should be that. The only thing I need to do is to get a slightly longer hose. This top hose is a fraction too short now. On this side the Jubilee clip is just catching it down here and if I wipe my finger under it it's ever so slightly damp so it's getting a little bit on the corner there but that's fine. I can get another bit of hose that's not a problem. So there we go guys, that seems to be it. New radio seems to do the job. Obviously I won't know until we get into the summer period when the weather, you know, when the temperature increases and I start driving on a daily basis. That will be when it, you know, when I can really say yes it makes a big difference or no it doesn't. And obviously when I get the new bonnet on it, it's gonna have a much better air path through it as well. But um as is for the moment, still with the number plate in situ driving it, no problem at all. It sits around 80 degrees when we're driving it. Um, and when you sit up stationary in traffic, it creeps up to about 90 and then the fans kick in and it drops back down again, which, as far as I'm concerned, is normal. And other than a very tiny leak on that top hose, um, it's all good. All the electrics work, everything's done. So, hopefully that's one problem cured. And if you have got overheating issues with your car, hopefully some of that information's been of help. You probably know it all already. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, but if not, you know, happy to have helped. So, we'll leave it there guys. Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. I like to think I will say so, but I do genuinely appreciate it. And I will see you next time, no doubt, with another problem. Even if there were no problems with the old classic cars, you will find a problem, won't you? Let's be honest. If you're a tinkerer, if you like pulling spanners, a car is never done. There's always a new bit you want to put on it or something you want to go back and do better. 
I guess that's part of the appeal of the hobby is just you know finding work, finding things to do, and I'm very much of that camp as well. So um, best of luck with your project. See you soon. Take it easy.